How is everybody doing? Good. We're, we're doing great. Welcome, welcome everybody to the ActDev Network on Clubhouse. My name is Dan Taylor, and I'm uh, one of the moderators along with uh, Bob Minhas and Lara Fritz. And uh, today we are talking about seasoned veterans and war stories and the like. So I'm really looking forward to this talk. Um, I am an economic development uh, professional working in the town of Innisfil, just north of Toronto. And I'm also a strategic advisor and guide to those in the profession. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to our main mod, Bob. And if you want to take it over, that'd be great, Bob. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Oh, so excited to be here. Looks like a great room. And this this particular room really excites me today because who doesn't love war, war stories, right? Hello. Hey, everybody. My name is Bob, Bob Minhas. I'm co host today along with Dan Taylor and Lara Fritz. Uh, and to, you are in the EpDev Network Clubhouse room. So if you haven't done so already, on the top of the screen, you'll see an economic development uh, you'll see the words economic development with a greenhouse. Click on that, and that'll allow you to stay in touch when we continue to run you in different rooms. Uh, today's topic, as I said, is all about war stories, about uh, your, the, uh, our speakers' experiences in economic development. Uh, so for those who have never been to the room before, I know we have some new listeners, including Ellen. Great to see you here, Ellen. Um, we are recording this session. Dan is really, really great at re-leveraging what we talk about here today in a future podcast so those that miss it can still participate now we have some amazing speakers on stage with clarence maureen and barry who are going to share some amazing stories but if you haven't done so yet be sure to click on their profile and follow them because my assumption is they're jumping into other clubhouse rooms and sharing other amazing knowledge and if you want to keep pace with what's happening in economic development globally these are just some of the people that you want to be following for sure now of course today's topic is all about war stories but if you have a colleague a friend a family member Remember, heck, even children or your mom that you would love to participate or just hear more about it. Uh, if you see there's on the bottom of the screen, there's a plus icon. When you click that, that'll allow you to ping some friends into the room so that they can also join in the conversation. If you've realized none of your friends, associates or, or people you know have Clubhouse access, please send a direct message to myself or Dan Taylor. We will be sure to get them set up on Clubhouse now that it's available for iPhone and Android. Um, for those of you in our audience, if you want to participate by pro providing a question or sharing a story, on the bottom you'll see a hand icon on top of a notepad. If you click that, that's a raised hand icon, and that'll allow myself, Dan or Laura, to bring you back on to bring you on stage so that you can participate. Now, quick tip: when you do that, and we bring you on stage, your mic's going to go hot or live. So be sure as soon as you jump on stage to hit mute once again, and that'll ensure you're not distracting any of the other speakers. Once you are on stage, or for even our speakers who are on stage now, if you haven't had a chance to participate too much on Clubhouse on a stage, I wanna give you some really cool tips that'll make your experience more enjoyable. Number one, if you hear something that someone else has said and you really agree with it, you can actually turn your mic on and off super quick, like Lara's doing right now, that indicates clapping. So that's basically clapping and acknowledging what's being said. If you have something that you want to share, and perhaps Lara and I or Dan are not getting to you, or we're, we're, we're taking a bit long, if you press your microphone on and off slowly, like Lara is doing right now, that's let, that lets us know that you do have something to share and that we can throw it to you next on the stage. And then finally, once you've shared something, just it's for, for ease of everyone else, if you just say your name once again and say, I'm done speaking. So for example, my name is Bob and I'm done speaking. That allows the other speakers to know or the moderators such as myself, Dan, or Lara, to know when to jump in and bring someone else in. But believe it or not, it's also an accessibility tool because not everyone listens to us on audio format on their devices. They have special devices to participate. So it allows them to participate in the conversation as well. Lara, I think I've covered everything. I just want to make sure I didn't miss anything before we jump right into our first question. No, you are fabulous at this. Thank you so much, Bob. <laughs> Thank you. The only reason why I asked Lara, guys, is she's so good for my ego. I love calling, coming to these calls. Really good for my ego. So I'm going to start with a speed round, if that's okay. So I'm going to throw it to each of our speakers here, Barry, Maureen, and Clarence. And what I'll do is maybe, Barry, I'll start with you because you share my initials. And then we'll go to Maureen and Clarence. First question okay. throughout to this day if that's okay, is um, fact or fiction, do we believe the office is dead in our communities? Barry, do you want to take that? Sure, I would say fiction. Wonderful. Maureen? Fiction, there's going to be a new normal. Ooh, I love that. Clarence? 
Uh, uh, no, fiction, adapt, Fle flexibility. Oh, flexibility. Clarence added his own one. That's it. I love it. Awesome. All right. Let's uh, throw it to the next one really quick. Retail in our communities will not bounce back from COVID-19. Barry, can I start off with you on this one? I would say fiction on that again. Maureen. It's going to be different. Fiction. <laughs> I love it. I love it, Clarence. Fiction. Adapt. Oh, man. I love the positivity on this call. This is phenomenal, phenomenal. I'm going to finish with one more speed round, and then I'm going to throw it to Dan for the next question. Speed round question. This past year has changed, fundamentally changed the way we do economic development. Fact or fiction? I'm going to start backwards and go right to Clarence. Clarence? Uh, uh, fact. I said fact. I'm oh, sorry. sorry. No, that was my fault. I had my mic off. Maureen, can I throw it to you? Fact or fiction? We, we are, how we do economic development after the last year is fundamentally different. Will be fundamentally different. Fact, as long as we take the time to learn from the past year and a half. Oh, I love that. Barry, can I throw that last one to you? Yeah, definitely a fact. And uh, I think not only our profession, but everything we do. Wonderful. I love these answers. They're so positive. It's amazing. Dan, can I throw it to you for the next question? And Dan, do you mind introducing yourself? Because we got a lot of new people in our room today. Great. Thanks, Bob. I'm just so excited. I didn't know we were like getting into Jeopardy territory here or, uh, or, or the price is right. I love the game show. I, I love it. I love it. I gotta figure out a good uh, wheel of fortune or something kind of graphic when I do a post. It's awesome. Uh, thanks, Bob. Yeah, I am the economic development catalyst for the town of Innisfil. I also uh, help the economic development profession out as a strategic advisor and guide. And I'm happy to help folks out on this call if they want to reach out to me at any point in time. So, this next question is for Clarence. Clarence, I know you've got limited time with us. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your career journey uh, and what your current role is. Maybe you could condense a few decades into a few minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Most definitely. Um, I'm one of the, I guess, few people who, I guess, came to the profession because I wanted to. Uh, went to school in uh, Southern Miss and got my master's in uh, e economic development. Uh, my name is Clarence Halls. Um, started in the field in the uh, mid 90s and uh, work in Florida. So um, that's been where I spent roughly 16 years, uh, both in uh, community and e economic development, uh, real estate development. I uh, built condos for a while in Florida. And then I guess you call it the dark side. And then I came to uh, Indiana for a few years, went to North Carolina, and then back in Indiana. I'm the director here in the city of Michigan City below uh, Lake Michigan, Southern Tip. Uh, in my role as a director, um, you know, small town, four staff of four people, we juggle multiple roles. Of course, business development, uh, BR and E are your main roles, but we have a broader mission in terms of community development, so we're doing food desert studies, incubator uh, networks, uh, workforce development uh, programs, um, and so our hands are kind of everywhere. But of course, the bread and butter is always, you know, uh, business development and uh, BRNE. And uh, our role has changed over the years in terms of how we work with business. And as we mentioned before with COVID, uh, we had to really jump into by 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 weekly phone calls with our um, mayor and council and business community and nonprofits the last year and a half to figure out how to get the community back on track. Again, new role for us and also working in the office, outside the office and doing stuff from a, using more more technology and investing in more technology. So um, lots of great stuff going on. I'm Clarence and I'm done speaking. Thank you, Clarence. That was awesome. That was an amazing, amazing answer. Uh, for the next question, Laura, can I throw it to you? Sure. Um, I'm Laura Fritz and a long-staying economic developer, have worked on everything from Main Street programs to large regional organizations. So um, currently I'm a consultant with Aspire USA where we assist um, communities in training 
women and BIPOC entrepreneurs. So it's been a lot of fun. And I am really excited for this panel today to share the stage with a number of my friends, including Barry Matherly. And so Barry, you've recently changed your, your career um, from a pure economic development role to now working for a site selection firm. Um, why don't you share a little bit about your career journey and maybe tell us a little bit about what it's like working in the private sector compared to the uh, public-private partnership. Well, let me start by saying I wish I knew then what I know now. Um, the um, It's been an amazing uh, journey here. The, the amount of information and what goes on in a site selection firm, which I'm a part of here, um, even though I'm doing the EDO consulting piece of it, is just amazing. Um, I have engaged with site selectors my whole life practically, but I have learned so much in the last year. I'd also say it's also amazing how much uh, site selectors don't know about economic developers. Uh, so I think there's more of a, a bridge to be built there. Um, kind of interesting fact, I actually started, if you think about economic development, uh, as an intern at the U.S. Department of Commerce. Uh, back in the 1980s. Uh, after three years, I said, I'll never do that type of work. And I actually spent six years in the private sector for a Fortune 500, uh, and then got back into economic development. I've loved it since, from small towns to counties to regions um, to university economic development. I've, I've had a, a, a good career, and I think this has been a, a lot of fun uh, in the consulting private sector side, getting to kind of apply kind of a career's worth of, of knowledge and getting to do it from a bunch of different angles. So it's, it's very fun. It's very exciting. This is Barry and I'm done speaking. Thank you, Barry. That's awesome. And just a reminder to the other speakers on stage, if you hear something and you want to jump in, please do. We love making this a rotating discussion. And of course, I want to throw it out to the audience. If anyone hears something that they want to participate on or offer on, that'd be wonderful as well. Um, I'm going to throw this next question to Maureen, if that's okay. So, Maureen, I'm hoping mm -hmm. I'm right. You are the you became the CEO of the Greater Detroit Regional Partnership. Did I say that right? It's actually Detroit Regional Partnership DRP. Oh. Uh, DRP. That's okay. We're new. We're new <laughs> <laughs> during the pandemic. So, I'd love to hear what was your career journey to Detroit, and what was it like mm -hmm. to start a whole new role in the mm -hmm. midst of global pandemic. Sure. Thanks so much, Bob. I really uh, love this opportunity to be here um, with um, some uh, colleagues that I've known for a long time and, and some new faces that I look forward to getting to know. So um, a, a little similar to um, Barry, I started out as an intern in economic development when I was at graduate school at the University of Michigan. And I worked for a guy named Mike Amon, who was just recently retired. Uh, but I worked for the predecessor of Ann Arbor Spark. Uh, which was the Washtenaw Development Council, um, also worked at the University of Michigan as a grad student at the same time. I'm going to date myself a bit. Um, setting up computer systems for economic development organizations throughout Michigan, developing uh, software apps and training people around the state. So that was a lot for a lot of um, hands-on education for someone in grad school. But I've never looked back and my career has taken me um, to lead organizations in Michigan, um, Arizona, as well as in um, Indiana uh, for the Indy Partnership. Um, so I was doing also some consulting work, which honestly I loved, and it was to teach economic development. And I really enjoyed that. Um, my late mom said I came home from the first day of kindergarten and said I wanted to be a teacher when I uh, grew up. And so I feel like I'm doing that by doing a lot of time teaching economic development. So um, Barry set up a terrific foundation for the Detroit Regional Partnership. I um, slid into that role on July 1st. Um, what was it like during the pandemic? It's still weird. I always joke that I did my interviews barefoot. That was fun. Um, but and no one knew, right, except those I tell like this group. But really, um, what was good for me is I knew the community. I've spent most of my career in the Detroit area, so I knew most of the board, I knew the local partners, and in fact, I knew five of the 20 staff, um, three of whom I had previously hired. So that made the transition a little easier, but it was a challenge to get to know all of the staff, to develop a culture, um, 
where they didn't know me, I've spent a lot of time doing one-on-ones. We've done them in parks, uh, remotely distanced with masks. I did that my first month in the job. Um, I do one-on-ones with each individual team member quarterly. Um, and we're starting to do more group things and uh, honestly in parks. We'll be back to the office uh, in the next month or so. We're, we're working into that. Um, but it's really been something I warn the team all the time. I can't sustain doing 10 to 12 meetings a day on Zoom. <laughs> so that's going to change. Um, but, you know, I will say in, in the path of my career, I've done uh, local, county, regional and state economic development. I've been blessed with amazing mentors uh, to help me guide the way. And I do try to pay that forward um, as well. But it's been an exciting career. Um, and I know we'll get into how are we going to do things a little differently? What did we learn uh, from the past year and a half? But um, I still think it's there is a career that you can stay in your whole career, not just for a couple of years in and out. Thank you, Maureen. That's that's amazing. That's an amazing share. So I, I, I oh, sorry, Lara, did you want to contribute? Yeah, I actually want to bounce off of something Maureen just said. And you know, I'm really fascinated. All of the speakers on the stage have had an entire career in economic development and have stayed in economic development. Often you see economic development professionals come in, they do a couple of years in economic development and then go do business development or take some other role. And so I'm really curious, what has kept all of you committed to this profession? Um, and why do you love it? And if you're committed against your own will, just alternate your mic three times and Laura and I and Dan will get you help. <laughs> <laughs> you go. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Who's in jail here? Well, I, I'll start, Laura, if that's okay. Um, I feel like it is a way to combine my interest in public policy, which is my master's degree, right? Um, my interest in how business works, but really my passion for helping communities. And I feel that every day, I can help to make a difference. Uh, that's what keeps me there. And every day is different. Heck, every Zoom call is different on topics we're dealing with and issues we're trying to solve and people we're trying to help. Uh, but really, it's the it's the diversity of every single day that keeps me engaged. Great, great thought there, Maureen. Uh, for me, it's always been about helping people and. My, my dirty secret is, you know, I was born and raised in the country of Belize, and I spent three years doing missions work in Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Guatemala, and southern Mexico. So I spent a lot of time working with refugees and orphanages in those countries, and I saw a lot of money being spent with not a lot of impact. And so I knew I wanted to uh, be in a profession that helped people. I didn't want to do social work. And so when I discovered the world of economic development, I realized quickly, um, if I can help a family um, gain employment and ensure a better life. Uh, that's the world I want to be in. And so for me, it's more than a job. It's a calling. I love working with people. I love helping people. And that's why, you know, I've stayed along, stayed in it for all these years. Clarence, and I'm done speaking. And Barry? Yeah, I think uh, the, the part about helping and what Clarence said just really kind of resonated with me is there's a lot of ways people are trying to help people. I think one that goes under the radar is economic development. And I think in some ways we, we provide the most help uh, for people by being able to self-support themselves. Maybe kind of move back and tell you how I got into this again. You know, I left commerce, I wasn't gonna do it. I was working in a Fortune 500 company. I decided to volunteer with a little uh, economic community group uh, near where I was living. And at some point, I just got more interested in that area, helping that area and being a part of that than I did with my full time job. And what I realized is there was a lot of different people trying to help in this community. Some people were more worried about, you know, the way adding sidewalks or putting trash cans in, or, you know, all kind of things you do to redevelop an area. But the people I saw that had the most impact were the economic developers on the staff, really trying to work with the business community and provide job opportunities. So in, in that, I just decided to go back and get my master's and start a whole new career. So I quit, 
spent two years getting my master's, ended up being able to work for the university and have been in it ever since. And it's always been about really trying to, to help people and not only help people, but help the communities they're in. And I think it's just such a major impact that we do, not only for people, but for the community. This is Barry and I'm done. Thank you. That is, that's some interesting, interesting insight. So I kind of want to feed off Laura's question there. Um, because I know with my experience in economic development, which is I haven't had a long career, I sort of stumbled into it. I actually came across it quite accidentally. And, uh, you know, it's great to hear sort of, you know, Barry, how you found it. I, I'd love to go back to Clarence and Maureen to ask when you were, you know, finishing high school and looking at post-secondary or considering career economic development really catch your attention well before you're in the careers here now, when you started, what, what, what really caught your attention to economic development? as a career option. So similar to what Barry had just shared. Maureen, can I throw it to you for that one? Yep, sorry, just getting my mic back on. That's okay. So, you know, the internship was so meaningful. And, you know, with my kids and every person I meet under the age of 16, I encourage them, if you think you have an interest, please get an internship and see if you really do and what you can learn. I, um, you know, I was an intern in a four-person organization, which meant we all got to do just about everything. I mean, there was one day where I was the only person in an office, and I don't know how often this would ever happen. A prospect came in the office. Now, mind you, I'm the intern. Um, I was the only one there. I brought him into the executive director's office, sat in the chair, and asked them all the questions I had heard before, right? So it was like, oh, this is kind of interesting. And my boss was in fact very proud of me um, after I did that. In a small organization, I did learn all the different aspects of it, right? And how I could actually uh, make a difference there um, at that level. So, you know, I was just really um, brought in because of you know, I thought I want at that point, I thought I wanted to be a city manager. That was, I was in public policy graduate school. I thought, oh, I think I want to be a city manager. I'm the oldest of five. I'm used to directing everyone around, right? That sort of came with my birth uh, position. But um, my boss at the time said, I know every city manager in Michigan. You don't want to do that. They get fired a lot. Let me tell you about economic development. And so if you know him or not, Mike Amon is the guy that inspired everything I did going forward. Thank you, Maureen. And Clarence. Hey, Maureen. They said city manager gets fired a lot. That's also true for, for, for us. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's true, too. Yeah. Uh, that happens a bit. Yes, you're right. Anyway. Um, <laughs> um, but also, you know, for me, it was just a natural progression. Uh, I'm a PK, uh, preacher's kid. So I was always helping people, you know, vacation Bible school, missions work. And so for me, the profession became a natural progression of that and uh, trying to be more effective. And I spent my first job doing research, progress into BRNE and then international trade. And then my second job, actually, Marine, was a deputy city manager. And so that involved planning, zoning, uh, you know, uh, police chief at one point, um, you know, uh, public work director at one point, and then yeah. uh, decided to move back into uh, uh, economic development. So for me, and then of course spent eight years being a developer in Florida, building condos uh, for a resort company across Florida and uh, Georgia and South Carolina. So kind of went around and then came back in. Uh, this is my safe spot. So um, I love what I do. And so in those jobs I had, like with the development, it was great learning that job and that feel, but uh, my heart was over here. And that's why I, I always came back. And so uh, for me, it's never been an issue of, um, you know, wh where I want to be. Um, I, I am in a place where I want to be I, I'll, always working with people, communities, seeing the impact you make in people's lives and the communities and, and seeing and working with finding great people along the way to, to evangelize uh, and, and, and have them drink the Kool-Aid. And that's always an ongoing, ongoing project for mayors and elected bodies. I tell all my friends that you can have great friends in the community, but the day they get elected, they know everything. And so you got you to gotta get to them before they get elected. <laughs> so I'm Clarence, I'm done speaking. <laughs> oh my gosh, Clarence, I love that because I actually just was having this conversation with someone about elected officials. So thank you for yes. saying it out loud. It's the elephant in the room, Lara. <laughs> I think we're all just sort of... Can I, and Bob, can I just build on something Clarence said uh, just because I think the way this was 
presented to me as this is what we do. We have this conversation, right? Um, I've always, I've provided, I've mentored a lot of people because like I said, I had terrific mentors and I do pay it forward. And I love to find young talent and mentor them uh, into careers in economic development. I've always advised people, it's really smart. If you think you want a career in economic development, find a way to get that very local experience, whether it's local economic development or local planning or whatever, because in the end, that's where the deals get done. And if you can bring some of that to the table, no matter what level you end up at, you know, county, regional or state, but if you can say you've been in the trenches getting the deal done, I just think, you know, long term career wise, it adds incredible value um, to what you can bring and a great respect for uh, the locals who in the end are going to make or break your deal. So I just think it's really important. And, you know, when when Clarence said that, it kind of triggered me to think, yeah, I, I had that experience. And guess what? I advise that all the time for people who are looking at a career in economic development. Really great insight, Maureen. Thank you. That's amazing. So what I want to do is uh, we have another question and I'm going to give it to Dan. But before I give it to Dan, I'm just going to reset the room because we've had some folks pop in. And for those that aren't familiar, we love resetting the room halfway through because we want people to stay engaged in the conversation. So allow me to do our intro again. Hey, everybody. I'm Bob Minhas. I'm co-hosting today's room with Dan Taylor and Lara Fritz here on stage. You are in the Economic Development Ec Dev Network Clubhouse Club. So if you haven't yet already, that greenhouse on the top, make sure you click it and follow it so you stay in touch with all of our future events that are happening here. Today's topic is we're talking about bumps, bruises, cuts, and probably some scratches in the career of economic development. We're hearing from some amazing speakers on stage today from Barry, Clarence, and Maureen. And I'm hoping at some point, Lara and Dan will chime in too, because I know they've had some amazing opportunities as well. Uh, now, if you're not familiar, this session is being recorded. We love recording the session and re-leveraging it as a podcast for those who can't attend the event here live and they still want to sort of benefit from what it is that we are sharing or what is being shared here on stage. For those in the audience, if you haven't done so yet, again, we have some amazing thought leaders here on the stage. Be sure to click on their profile. Make sure you follow them because if they're in other rooms here on Clubhouse, you want to make sure you get notified of that because they're probably going to drop some amazing knowledge there as well. If you're hearing some amazing things being shared in this room, certainly you could listen to the podcast later. Or if you want to invite some of your colleagues, friends, family, maybe even your neighbor to come on and listen in, there's that plus button on the bottom of the screen. When you click on that, that'll allow you to invite folks into the room. Now, if you have friends or associates you want to invite, but they're not yet on Clubhouse, send myself or Dan Taylor a direct message on LinkedIn, and we will be sure to get them set up so that they can join us in the future. If you in the audience want to participate in the discussion, perhaps you have your own war stories or even have a question you want to share, uh, feel free to press the hand icon over the notepad icon on the bottom that raised hand icon allows myself, Dan, or Lara to invite you on stage so that you can participate in what's happening. When we do that, keep in mind your, your mic does go hot or live. So as soon as you jump on stage, you want to hit mute so that you're not being uh, disruptive to the other speakers as well. If you are in the audience and you're hearing some, uh, excuse me, if you are on our stage and you want to get more out of the experience and you hear something that you really resonate with, if you press your mic on and off super fast, just like, uh, well, Lara, usually they're like what Lara and Dan are doing right now, that indicates applause that you really resonate with what's happening here. If you press your mic super slow, that like Dan and Lara are doing now, that lets us know that you have something you want to share and we can throw the mic to you. Uh, again, you could always just release your mic and just say, hey, I have something to share as well. When you have shared something on stage, feel free to say your name once again and that you're done speaking. So, for example, I'm Bob and I'm done speaking. That allows the other speakers to know when they can pipe in. But it also works as an accessibility tool because not everyone listens to us on, on standard audio apps. So we want to make sure that they can participate as well. I think I've covered everything in the, um, in the chat and we've just lost Lara. So, Dan, if you don't mind, I'm going to throw it to you for the next question, if that's okay. Thanks, Bob. And I'm so uh, so enthusiastic towards our our panel today. And you know, the first thing that that wants to come out of my mouth is, I want to be in economic development. And then I forgot, of course, I've been in economic development <laughs> for, for for 20 years, so I certainly share all the enthusiasm and excitement. But what a great man! We got to get this. We got to get this uh, recording out to uh, to uh, new entrants and 
and early career people and people making decisions. I think this would be, you know, for people that really want to make a difference and help. Um, yeah, it's just great. Anyway, so, I think Dan, go ahead. I think Brian, do a live from a bar. <laughs> we can have a, a, a nice beer or a glass of wine as we're sharing more war stories. Maybe yeah. we should do that. <laughs> Absolutely. Looking forward to that. So uh, I think we're going to go do a round table here. Um, this past year has been really challenging for economic development professionals. I don't think I need to, to explain how the effects the pandemic has had. Um, what was the biggest opportunity you saw and used to benefit your organization and I would say community as well? Um, why don't we start with Barry just because he's uh, just to the right of me. Over to you, Barry. Very good. It was an interesting time, and, and I guess if I had to sum it up, I would say technology. Um, I think as a profession, we think we have a lot of technology, but compared to a lot of other professions, I think we actually were trailing. Um, however, in the pandemic, I think the immediate need, as we know, to, to go virtual, uh, to change the way we do things, to rethink everything around a, a new platform was amazing opportunity. And during any major event like this, it's also a great time to reposition yourself. I think there's no better time to change your, your order, uh, no matter where you are, if you, if you think you can move up, um, because there's a major reset going on last year, and it's still continuing this year. And those who kind of adapted to the change and adapted to the new technologies have been able to kind of move forward. And so I think there's been a great shift and your ability to kind of get in the new paradigm and really work with it and really understand it and, and not just take what you used to do and put it online. That's that's not what I'm talking about. Coming up with whole new ways or ways of using that are, are totally unique to the economic development profession. And so I think that's been the really exciting thing coming out of this. And not only do I see that when I was managing an EDO you know, during the pandemic, but now on the other side, working with EDOs all across the country and globally, just the amazing things we're seeing coming and the ideas that people are, are continuing to come. I think we've we've had more ideas in the last probably you know year or so, um, new ideas and new ways of doing things than we had maybe in the past 20 years. So I think it's been very exciting and it was a great opportunity to kind of leverage new platforms. I'm Barry Matherly and I'm done speaking. Bob and Dan, if you don't mind, I want to ask a little question off of what Barry just said. So, Barry, last week we had Chris Lloyd join us um, from McGuire Woods. And one of the things he talked about was data, that economic development organizations need more data. And I think that sort of aligns to the technology conversation. Um, what kind of data are you seeing economic development organizations you know, really the stellar economic development organizations producing and what would you like to see more of? That's a great question. Yeah, I, I would say not just data, but how you use the data. I think there are a lot of great third party providers of data out there and they provide a lot of strong data, a strong platform. I think it's what you do with the data that makes the difference. I see people taking it, using it all kind of different ways always I'm amazed to see like the same data represented like 10 different ways um, just how you could look at it and I think that's really the key thing is you know that so often we get data and there's already a nice chart created for us and the technology and we, we just take okay we're going to look at this chart and see what we can get it out of it but that same data can create maybe 10 other charts and so taking the same data and just looking at it through many different viewpoints, I think really provides more insight in, into what's going on. I think the other thing I see that's it's pretty interesting is um, getting beyond just transactional data. I, I think as a profession, we were very based on the project, at least it came with, you know, with our job numbers and um, everything, just really kind of driving this project type mentality. Um, and the data needed for the project. I think a lot of groups are going way beyond that now to getting really more into the people involved into the project, the communities, the, the kind of the, the way the company that you're working with, kind of what their um, kind of guiding principles are. It's getting very 
very beyond just kind of the, the base transactions of you know how many acres you need and this kind of thing. It's getting to be really kind of a more of a total ecosystem look at, at some of these companies that you're either engaged in or that you want. Um, I was working with a company recent or a community recently where um, they had actually uh, put together a whole proposal for a company that had never contacted them. Uh, they just had identified them, had, had read some news, um, and then actually thought this would be a great place if that's what they're thinking, and then dug into the company, got the intelligence, and then presented them with a proposal. Um, so I think there's just so much that could be done. It's just taking the time to really, um, don't, don't be satisfied with the first graph or the first piece of information you get. Really kind of just keep pushing it and pushing it. And there's some, some groups that have internal teams now that are just kind of competitiveness teams that are looking and just really responsible for not just research and getting information or responding to RFIs, but really kind of doing progressive forward looking research. That's uh, that's amazing, Barry. And I'm uh, I'm going to move to Maureen in a moment, but I just wanted to, again, what I'm and what I'm loving about our our um, clubhouse talks is there's all these connections. The one that Lara just made, the other one was we had um, Stephen Jast on uh, a few weeks ago, and he was talking about Gazelle, uh, which you know is very much about data and data mining. And I like the fact that what you indicated is uh, one of the groups that you are aware of took data and information and, and news and said, oh, there is an opportunity. They may not be looking to come to our community, but we're going to make a pitch and we're going to make the case. Now, that's entrepreneurship. That's private sector thinking. And I love I love to hear that uh, in economic development because we I think we need we need more of that. So thanks for sharing that, Barry. Much appreciated. Um, over to you, Maureen. Do you need to refresh the question or do you remember what it was? Sure, because I have answers for two other things you said. So let's go back to your original question okay. and then I can build on that. All right. OG question is, this past year yes. has been challenging for our profession. Yes. What was the biggest opportunity you saw and used mm -hmm. to benefit your org? And I, I'm adding slash mm -hmm. community. Yes. Um, thank you. Because every comment I've heard, I've thought, oh, wait, I could say something about that. So let's go back to what the biggest opportunity for us has been. And I'm going to go back a little bit to my experience being a Detroiter um, growing up here and, and working in economic development before I went to Indy and, and then coming back. I believe for many years, many, many years, Detroit let everyone, and when I say Detroit, I mean the region. I have an 11 county region in the Detroit Regional Partnership. I think for many years, Detroit let everyone else tell their story. And uh, we have to own our story and we have to proactively tell it. So this has given us an opportunity. You know, we haven't done traditional trade shows, conferences, going out to meet with our um, influencers. Uh, that we need to talk to. So we've had to get much better at telling our story and proactively telling it to the right markets, the right people, using the data um, that we spend a lot of time with an excellent research team uh, putting together. Uh, we, As far as technology goes, I think another thing that we have learned, you know, I don't like to do anything unless I can especially send, spend resources, unless we can leverage it in the future. So I think really is a really smart time right now to be leveraging and thinking about what did we learn and how can we use that for our betterment in the future. So I'll just give an example of site stories. I've done my whole career a lot of international work, the Detroit Regional Partnership, a lot over uh, probably about 60% of our work with prospects is international. So here's what we learned. Everyone's figured out how to do a virtual site tour, right? I mean, from iPhones to more sophisticated, showing sites, using drones, getting more people involved in seeing our communities while we haven't been able to travel. And that's been even more important internationally, right? Because great restrictions. So, um, but, you know, I think about the work I've done for years and the work, the site tours I've done with international firms. And typically they'd either send someone out who was already in North America or they'd send out someone from engineering and facilities. The reality is the key decision maker is not in the initial group. 
but frequently those first impressions will guide where a project will go. Well, what we've been able to do is bring those key decision makers in much earlier by being able to show off our community and our sites and our opportunities um, it, you know, in an environment on Teams or Zoom or wherever. So bringing in key decision makers earlier is our takeaway on how we will be more effective going forward. And in the end, um, getting more wins because you know we're not concerned about a level that might have other biases on where we should be. We're getting the people who are making the final decisions early on. That's very exciting for us. And I think it's really important as we look at continuing to view economic development from the Detroit Regional Partnership perspective as an international um, uh, sort of mission that we have. So that's just been something that has been in the back of our minds the whole time. And now it's to execute. We're still going to go visit our customer. We can't wait. We're road warriors. And we know going to your customer is the most important thing but we can bring more people into those early um, strategic meetings and conversations. And I'm Maureen and I am finished that, for now. That was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot for sharing that Maureen. Um, really great information and great insights. Clarence, I'm going to restate the question just to make it a little easier for everybody and then over to you. So this past year, as we know, has been extremely challenging for our work. What's the biggest opportunity you saw and used to benefit both your organization and the community? Dan, over to you. Uh, Clarence Holtz, again, uh, Barry and uh, Marina piggyback on what they have said. Um, definitely on barriers, technology resonate with me because that's one of the things that we had to quickly um, look at and had to invest some money quickly in that. But um, one, of the, for, one of the big things for us is just the networking and the value of BRNE uh, because we had to quickly begin communicating with the community and BRNE from the standpoint of not only the business leaders but also the community leaders, the nonprofits, the, uh, the the city leaders, uh, the schools, and so we had biweekly um, uh, phone calls discussing issues in regard to COVID, getting getting people fed, people who are losing their jobs, getting housing, uh, work, work work with companies uh, who are laying off people or, or doing, and so we were very involved in directing in. Um, um, uh, showing resources in the community, and so for us that was a. Uh, uh, kind of, we had to drop everything, so, so to speak, and do that for almost a year. Uh, still working projects, but uh, of course we couldn't go and do the normal BRNE, as in you know going on visit. We were doing a lot of phone calls, but also having these biweekly um, 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 uh, phone calls uh, with uh, 25, 30 community leaders uh, on the phone. So um, the value of BRNE and the value of workforce. So our key word has been reset. Just relooking at everything we have done in the past. And how do we do it differently? But how do we add value to it? And what sort of value to our community during a disaster? I've been involved in the disaster planning, uh, living in Florida for 16 years. So in a disaster, hurricane, tornado, the disaster happens, and you go do triage and you figure out, you know, who, who, uh, to turn the lights on, get the flooding issues fixed, and you move on. Um, COVID-19 uh, is unlike any other disaster I've been involved with. It's a disaster that you keep trying to plug the hole, but it keeps going. And so, you know, there's people falling around you like flies, and you, you're trying to figure out how to how to make things work and how not, not to have the world shut down around you. So it was, uh, you know, so learning how to operate in that environment is like being in the ER room, but, you know, you're trying to plug a patient and there's blood flying all over you. Uh, so uh, for us, it was just a, a different way to do business. And so for it's just, for me, the word that comes to mind is reset, uh, looking at how we do business, but also doing things differently, smarter, more efficiently, and how do we provide value to our communities? Clarence, I'm done speaking. Thank you, Clarence. That, that was some amazing insights there from all three of our speakers. That was awesome. Laura, for the next question, can I throw it to you? Absolutely. So one thing that I'm really curious about is looking back on your career, what is maybe one of the greatest pieces of advice you received? Um, and how did you use it? And maybe 
how are you still using it? And why don't we go ahead and start with Clarence? Wow. Uh, <laughs> uh, I would say lifelong learner. Um, I learned very quickly and I had a great boss, Italian American. He said, you got to know everything, just a little bit of everything to be dangerous. <laughs> and so, and so in this business, <laughs> you have to know a little bit of everything. So I still read magazines or on plastic extrusion, uh, welding technology, not because I plan to be a welder in my life, but I you need to learn the lingo, understand when you talk to a manufacturer, what's, what makes the bottom line work. And uh, when you go to these meetings, you don't have to be a CEO for a, a medical uh, company, but lo- learning financials, learning, learn, learning business plans. And so for me, being a lifelong learner has been the best advice I got. And anybody coming into business, that's what, what I would impart to them. Read everything you can get your hands on. Be aware of the world around you. Be a lifelong learner. I'm Clarence and I'm done speaking. Oh, that is so good. Um, Barry, let's go to you next. Well, it's funny that uh, you sit and you think about your answer. And then when the, the person before you takes it, I'm like, wow, this is awesome. We have the same answer. So I always say it a little differently, and I, I call it a student of the profession. And it's the same concept as Clarence just had, is that I was told long ago, you you know, when you think you know everything, you, you definitely don't. Um, and if you think you're the smartest person in the room, you're not. Um, the person who thinks they can always learn and the person who thinks they can take something away from every conversation, that's the person who's going to be the smartest person in the room. So I've always tried to, to really be a student of the profession and really focus on economic development. Um, you know, in the early stages, you do training, you attend uh, seminars. I still love going to conferences and sitting in on the educational sections and learning new things. Uh, and then I think as you get later in your profession, you're expected to give back and then you become more of a teaching classes. And even though you're teaching them, it's amazing how much you can learn from the students. Um, and what concepts and ideas they bring up. And I think as a profession, we're not afraid to challenge each other too and kind of go back and forth on, on some of the teaching. So um, I still enjoy teaching. I still enjoy learning. I still enjoy being a student of this profession and it'll never be done. It'll be something I, I continue to have interest in and it's just really served me well because I've been able to just kind of keep growing in the profession. And when you think you've got to one point, you can always grow some more. So. I definitely stepping over here into the private sector of economic development and being in a consulting role and inside a site selection firm uh, has been a huge growth opportunity and a huge learning curve. So it's really been exciting and it's really just kind of propelling me and it really gets me excited about the profession. I'm Barry and I'm done. Oh, Barry, I love that so much because you're right. Once you're in economic development, I think it gets in your blood and you always want to and hunger for knowing more. Um, And one thing I love about this Clubhouse Chats is I get to learn from people all over the world, which has been so much fun. Um, Dan and Bob, I really want you to jump in on this question too, but let's go to Maureen um, and share your best piece of advice that you've received and how have you used it? Thanks, Lara. And yeah, Clarence and Barry just made really an important point. I think we all um, succeed in this industry when we are all lifelong learners. And, you know, I've always told my teams, please don't ever say to me, well, this is how we've always done it. Um, That doesn't go far with me. But so sort of leveraging just a couple of bullet points to me that is like important um, advice that I've received that I try to use every day. Um, One is customer first partner first. Um, We all have partners that we have to leverage uh, to be successful. You know, the old saying, it's a team sport. It truly is. But also put yourself in the customer's mind. Don't talk about, well, here's a regulation that you have to follow. Think about how the customer hears that. Uh, So that's one. This is something that you've heard before, but I do try, you know, we get a lot of amazing opportunities in our line of work. Um, And so one thing that always sticks with me is it's nice to be important, but it's always important to be nice. Um, I just think that takes you far in life. Um, And, you know, finally, um, I would say that this is maybe a funny one to end with, but my first boss, I remember when I was negotiating right out of grad school for my first job, and we were trying to figure out a start date. And he looked at me and he said, Maureen, 
here's something I always live by. I never miss a vacation day. I will be gone for three weeks in the beginning of June. So why don't you start when I come back? And you know what? We all need to be better than that. I will say right now in my almost year on the job, I would fail that right now. But if you can take time to reset, to think, to relax and rest, you'll just be better at what you do, really no matter what your job is. But I think we have very busy days. We have very busy jobs. Um, Taking that time is just important and makes us more productive and uh, a better teammate for our teams. And if I could add something to what Maureen said, I think she's absolutely right. And it's something maybe it, we, we learn as we go on, but I, I can imagine people that work for me when I was uh, younger years probably thought it's pretty hard life uh, working there. And we always thought because we were doing a great mission and had so many important things to do, we had to kind of really always be buckling down. And really, I think what she said is absolutely true. When you have the ability to step back and refresh, I think you're, you're more productive. You don't burn yourself out and you can give more back. So for me, that took a while to learn, but I, I do think that's great advice. Barry, as I've told my team in the past, we are not doing brain surgery. We're not doing open heart surgery. Our work is very important, um, but you know, sometimes you just have to have to relax. So, yep, agree with you. I'm Maureen and I'm finished. I love it. Dan, I'd love to hear you, the best piece of advice you've received. So, interestingly, I'm going to I'm going to riff I'm going to have a little bit of fun. <laughs> so there's two themes. The best piece of advice I ever received, I actually was um, the CEO of uh, Peterborough Economic Development, but was um, hired on a two week contract to facilitate some tourism and marketing and branding discussions in the Philippines. And interestingly enough, the first time I went, they gave you like a day off each week and I never really got to see the country. So talk about the vacation part. So they brought me back the second year and I wanted to learn how to surf and uh, actually at 50 years old. So uh, anyway, I learned about this area. So I went up to this area something something called Del Sur a few hours north of Manila and and it was incredibly hot like you would burn your <laughs> you would burn your feet on the beach and the and the ocean was like 33 degrees Celsius uh, anyway it was, it, it was a renowned area for um, moderate and consistent waves so my um, my surf instructor's name was Peter and they're they're sort of formal there so they, they'll call you sir or in this case uh, Mr. Dan so Peter would call me Mr. Dan. So as I was getting up on the on the surfboard and he would hold it and he would sort of push me with the wave to to get it, his his piece of advice to me was balance, Mr. Dan, balance. And uh, I was never really sure if he was talking about surfing or something else. So I'm going to take it that he was my spiritual guide. And, and at that point in time, I certainly needed some balance when you're the CEO of a, of a, a ECDEV org. I think you guys know, know what I'm talking about. The other isn't really a piece of information, uh, but I, I learned it. I actually was working in a marketing agency and Hostess Frito-Lay was our client. And this is actually prior to job prior to starting an economic development. And their whole thing was innovation, innovation, innovation. And uh, uh, I came from a creative and a creative marketing background, so that wasn't new to me, but just that their mantra was so strong, it really stuck, struck, stuck with me. I carried that throughout my career, and when I landed in uh, the town of Innisfil, I was really delighted to learn that their CEO, actually the CEO was the first person in economic development that I worked for that was more creative than I was because I usually worked for you know city managers, bureaucrats. Uh, nothing wrong with them. They just think differently. Uh, whereas this CEO, highly creative, highly innovative. And uh, so I think just the, the, the idea of innovation, right? Let's not rest on our laurels. Uh, let's be creative. Let's look for new and different ways to go about things um, is, a, is a great way. So balance from uh, Peter teaching me uh, surfing and innovation from 
uh, I my claim to fame is I helped put uh, Bart Simpson on Frito Lay potato chip or on Frito Lay on Doritos in the, in, in the turn of the century at uh, 1999 2000. I'm Dan and I'm done speaking. Bob, what was your best piece of advice? That's yeah. I, I'm happy to share. I will. I'm always transparent in the fact that I, I did have a short career in economic development, but I still work with a lot of economic development communities and, and agencies. And there's two things that I really, I'm glad that I started off with. I think it would have fostered probably more time in economic development. Number one was, uh, again, as I said, I stumbled into the role of economic development. But when I got in, the first thing I did was find a mentor. And uh, uh, Dan might know him. It was another Dan. He was he was economic development in Vaughan, the city of Vaughan. And uh, Dan Ruby was an amazing mentor because, you know, he had not only worked at the small business level, uh, small business enterprise center level, but also at the economic development level. And I, you know, I needed that person that I could honestly call and ask honest questions, right? Because I think as economic development officers, or maybe in general, we, we assume sort of this professional stance where we really don't want to be vulnerable or open. But uh, Dan was, uh, Dan Ruby was really great and really great at, being open and letting me sort of share, you know, what my fears were and what my challenges were and what wasn't working. And, and he had always had some really, really great advice. And his advice was very practical and tactical, right? He wouldn't just say, well, you kind of got to figure it out or make it work. He kind of say, well, you know, try this or this is what I, and he always did it in storytelling. Dan Ruby was really good at sharing stories. So he'd say, let me tell you a time when I ran into something similar. So the first thing I would suggest for any new entrant or even someone that's been in it for a few years, Really look and find that mentor that you connect with on a values level, on an energy level, and you know someone that you can talk to. Because believe it or not, Dan Dan Taylor here uh, is a great example, and I've just been dealing more with Lara, but Dan Taylor is a good example. He's always been open to me. Literally, if I ever have a question, I could text Dan and be like, you know, let's have a, a chat. And and I thought in my early in my career that was impossible to find. That if I opened myself up to that sort of vulnerability, that it would impact my career prospects, I would get judged. But that was the, the number, the, sort of the first thing that I did that I'm really glad I did was find that mentor, connect with that mentor and, and you know, really open yourself up to that person to learn from them. And I think everyone on this stage, except me, everyone else on this stage would make for an amazing mentor. I don't mean to volunteer anyone, but that would be it. And number two, the other thing I learned really quick was I went into economic development out of entrepreneurship, similar to Dan. So I had sort of been a business owner for so many years, uh, which was pretty isolating, right? It was just me. So I wasn't really good with internal politics, uh, just to put, you know, talk about another elephant in the room. So I did a lot uh, of courses on emotional intelligence. And I know that might sound crazy, but I got to tell you, studying personality traits, emotional intelligence, Myers-Briggs, all of these sort of components really helped me not only connect and network well with our clients in economic development, but internal stakeholders. Because I think as an economic development officer, you've got to deal with counsel, you've got to deal with CAOs, you've got to deal with planning and building. So those all, and I, I, and I don't mean to sound crass here, but in my experience, they all have a certain type of personality that work well in those roles. So you're constantly having to shift yourself. So being able to understand the personality traits or read the personality traits of people and then mirror myself or augment myself to work best with that personality style as opposed to going head to head, that really helped me uh, thrive in economic development. I was, you know, and again, just to be very transparent, I stumbled into economic development with nine years of entrepreneurial experience. So I had no real government experience. And then my career went from, I, I went from a small business center to an economic development officer to the, you know, like it just grew in three, four years. And I, I credit a lot of that to investing time in understanding people and personalities and traits, what motivates people, how can I mirror myself to those people? So that would be sort of my go-to to give out there, I think, Laura. That's awesome. Can you believe it's already one oh three? And I know that Barry, Maureen, and Clarence all are super busy people, but I just want to thank my friends Barry, Maureen, and Clarence for joining us today for this conversation. I know I took away a lot of great information, and I, again, I'm so thankful for our friendship. So, thank you, everyone. And then before, thank you, yeah. thank you, and, before, and thank and, you, Barry, Maureen, Laura, got yeah. to be here, learn, learn a lot, and. Uh, Looking forward to seeing you guys in person soon. 
That's yeah, it's great, great to be a part oh. of it. Thank you. And, yeah. and before, we we lose, just... before we lose everybody friend. else, Lara, I think you can't get away without sharing your, your learning. <laughs> Please, you can't be like a candid candid the moderator <laughs> oh well here i was hoping to just kind of slip out you know i would say that the best piece of advice i ever received in my career um was really twofold um first was paul love from rockville he had given me a great piece of advice which is don't get mad about everything but get mad about the things that are really important to you so that people know when you're really upset about something that it's truly um important and I think that was a great piece of advice really early on in my career because when I was young, it was like, oh, I can't believe this happened. Oh, I can't believe that happened. Um, and so, you know, really picking and choosing what made me angry, I think really is helpful. Um, the second great piece of advice I received was from Mike Lofton in Annapolis, Maryland. And he said to me, never turn down a, an opportunity, a professional opportunity that hasn't been offered to you. If someone calls and says, I want to talk to you about an opportunity, talk to them. You just never know where that is going to take you. Um, and I would say that that's been great advice and it's led me on this wild ride of an economic development career, but it's also introduced me to amazing friends. And so um, I would say that was an, another great piece of advice, which is don't turn down an opportunity that has not been fully offered to you. So. And and Lara, speak to about what's going on Friday. <laughs> so Friday, we're going to talk about community colleges and the impact of them on our profession. Um, the 16th, we're going to talk succession planning in economic development organizations. The 18th, we're going to talk strategic planning and what your consultant wants you to know. So lots of great content coming up. So please stay tuned and stay connected with us. We look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank Great. you. Have Great. a good day. Thanks, Great everyone. Participation. Thank you so much.